Okay, so whenever you're ready, uh, uh, we have Sukdeep and Celine here with our, our last policy challenge uh, presentations. Go ahead. So in Canada, we don't know the level of disparity in substance use across sexual orientations, even though this information is important for the development of programs and interventions. To address this issue, our project uses longitudinal health administrative data to investigate the level of substance-related acute care across sexual orientation in Ontario. Additionally, we investigated whether socioeconomic deprivation can further exacerbate substance use disparities by sexual orientation. To examine disparity by sexual orientation, we conducted discrete event history analysis stratified by sex to examine if LGB individuals were more likely to have a substance use related acute care event compared to the general population. To understand whether socioeconomic deprivation modifies the effect of sexual orientation, we included interaction terms between socioeconomic status and sexual orientation in our discrete event history regression. Our study findings showed that sexual minority individuals are more at risk for substance use related acute care compared to the general population. Specifically, bisexual women are at highest risk for substance use related acute care across all substances. In addition, there's an increased risk for any substance use related acute care for bisexuals with low socioeconomic status. Our results highlight the need for targeted measures to help reduce substance use related acute care among sexual minority individuals. Today, we would like to elaborate more on one specific potential policy, on-site harm reduction. Frontline harm reduction, such as harm minimization booths, can be a cost-effective intervention to reduce the harmful consequences of substance use. A 2015 review found harm reduction interventions to be an effective public health policy when implemented appropriately within their contextual settings. Since venues and events where LGB socialization takes place provides access to substances such as the annual Pride celebrations, we recommend increased funding to organizations or public health units to provide harm reduction services at these sites. Thank you. Thank you. So I think our first uh, question will be uh, Claudia, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for your study. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation, the interaction between the two of you. It, uh, it was great. So thanks for that. Super important subject. Um, you know, we see lots of um, lots of disparities between uh, this population and among this population. Um, I know you wanted to focus on your policy on harm reduction, um, but I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about potentially upstream policy. So we know amongst this group, for example, that they have much higher rates of mental health. Um, I mean, another outcome is higher rates of, of suicide as well, but I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about um, how else your findings can inform more upstream uh, policies um, uh, and, inter and interventions. So um, if I am understanding your question, uh, are we kind of like mm, looking at some other policies we also highlighted in our initial presentation, talking about how we need to have more training for primary care physicians to be more culturally sensitive towards LGBT individuals. And we do think that it's extremely important as well. Um, I believe that Rainbow Health, uh, RHO, Rainbow Health Organ Ontario, Yes, Rainbow Health Ontario trains clinicians across Canada interested in working with the LGBTQ2S community. Um, and that's something that's currently ongoing. I feel that a uh, part, certain part of that that can be improved upon is feedback from the community itself about the efficiency of, um, from physicians and how efficient or how like, well they're catering to their mental health needs and their physical health needs, whether these things are being addressed. Um, and feedback should go to physicians for them to either in, be involved in more training or how they could improve their services to better cater towards the LGBT community. Thank you. All right, Monica. Okay, again, thank you so much um, for, for your presentation and the research that you're doing. And, and it is something where, again, mental health and, and being able to help um, the community out and it, I think it's kind of following up from what Claudia, you know, talked about in the upstream part, but the thought about um, not just clinicians, but like um, policing and uh, educators in, in, you know, public and high schools and being able to have that understanding 
of how to help the community and how, specifically with substance abuse, because it's not just physicians that will be working with, um, you know, individuals as it relates to that. So have you given any thought about adding other data sets to be able to help support um, your information, not just within uh, health, but in, in other broader aspects of the social side? So I feel that, um, you know, this was an attempt that we made was to connect the uniform crime report statistics to understand the level of hate crime occurring in the cities and to integrate it with our data set. And I think that's where we faced some challenges integrating that data set. Um, I feel that my feedback for this would be that it would be better to kind of open this up so that we're able to get more hate crime statistics to be able to support and inform the police departments in this like municipalities or um, certain jurisdictions because I know that police jurisdictions across Canada is a little bit scattered and all over the place it's not very consistent so um, there needs to be a little bit more uniformity so that we're able to integrate it and see if you know a certain level of hate crimes in certain areas are, are, are affecting mental health or substance use or suicide rates by the LGBT community um, it will you know, kind of bridge that gap, especially with the police and everything that's been going on. You know, the issue that's being raised right now about policing at Pride, I think this kind of research will help bridge that gap and, and kind of increase the communication between both sides. All right, Hugh. Yeah. Um, thanks uh, very much for this important, uh, shedding some light on this important topic. I guess I, I have, um, you know, a question on, you know, your, the, the data set you used was kind of these severe uh, health outcomes. Are you able from your data to uh, also make any sort of conclusions or, or you know, um, insights into kind of lesser acute things, maybe like eating disorders or something along that lines, uh, where you can, uh, you know, because you're using kind of the more serious uh, health outcome is there any way you can, what, do you think that there, uh, do you have the ability to come give some of those insights out? So the so, less acute. Um, so for the purposes of this project, you're right, we did stick to the more severe um, events, uh, acute care utilization from knackers. Uh, we did not look at the less severe ones. Uh, I think that's definitely a great future direction. Uh, you know, that's something that we can look at um, in the future, I, I think. But for the purposes of this, we, we stuck to the acute care. Thank you. With knackers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to add to that, it would be, you know, helpful because um, of the disparate, like it's different across provinces, the, the kind of reporting that occurs um, and it, for Ontario, we'd be able to, not at the RDC, but it would be helpful to link it to OHIP data of like physician visits and the kind of diagnosis associated with patients that we would not be able to capture in acute care records. Um, until, you know, even if OMERS, the Ontario Mental Health, uh, it wouldn't be severe and it wouldn't occur until it's severe enough to land somebody into a psychiatric ward. So that kind of data linkage would really help improve the kind of research that we could do moving forward. Thank you. Okay, Umit. Yeah, I mean, I'm my what what I had in mind very much aligned with what my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, on that very last point, before I forget, I wonder if ICES they would have data that could help further follow up with this study. The Ontario Institute, well, ICES now it's called. Uh, I'm sure you may be familiar with them. But anyway, leaving that aside, I guess whether it's acute care or not, or, you know, um, uh, larger um, uh, impact or outcomes uh, uh, framework, uh, I wonder how, if you were to be able to measure, depending on data and whatnot, how race, religion, religion for sure, and kind of ethnocultural background would, what type of a layer uh, of factors would those uh, variables throw into the mix in terms of variation and also of course uh, solutions. And then of course, you know, blended with the same concept uh, where structured data may not be available. Uh, what would you do if you had the magic kind of a, you know, um, uh, resource, uh, there to throw at uh, hiring some um, qualitative researchers and doing some 
you know, mixed method kind of a deep dive into the experiences of different uh, populations or stratified uh, the, one, the ones that you're looking at in terms of how they are experiencing um, uh, access and uh, what they get out of it. And in fact, what type of support they receive or not receive uh, from their immediate uh, environments. Um, thank you for that question. I agree 100%. Uh, variables like especially religion, as you rightly pointed out, I think that would have a great impact on their experiences. For our study, we did include uh, ethnicity and immigration status just to control for the effect of that. Um, but definitely, if we had a magic wand, I, I think it would be very interesting to um, look at how religions, certainly some of them are more conservative than others, you know, how their religion affects their experiences as a LGB minority group uh, and how they uh, cope with that. But we tried to uh, control for some of it, at least, with um, the ethnicity status and the immigration status. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what my partner Sadiq has mentioned before. Um, and I think part of the limitation that we were facing is the, um, the small sample size with um, ethnic minorities and immigrants who are LG, who identify as LGB within a province. It's it's tough to compare between provinces to get the kind of sample size. Um, and you know, for a mixed method follow-up, it will be really interesting to look and see how some of these individuals understand their healthcare utilization, kind of, you know, follow up with some interviews to see in which areas that can be improved, which areas could be addressed, like what part of unmet healthcare needs that they're facing. So that we're able to understand this better. Okay, so uh, Tammy is the last judge question here. Hey, thank you. Um, I enjoy uh, hearing about projects like this because we have to learn a lot more about these linkages uh, between data sets, which, you know, especially for, for topics like this are so valuable um, because when you look at the results, you can have a lot more confidence in them than you would if you were relying on self-reported well-being and, and outcome type measures, right? So, so I was actually going to take this opportunity to get you to speak a little bit more about the type of data that's available in, in what you're working with. And if you can speak to the extent to which self-reported uh, data would not be as useful, not just in terms of measurement error, but how that measurement error might differ across the groups that you're interested in, because that's the, that's the larger bias that we might be interested in knowing about. Sorry, I was um, just to, to understand your question again. So you were just um, wondering if self-reported bias <laughs> and how it might differ. So I think there's a certain level of social desirability bias that happens with self-reported surveys. And I think there would be an underrepresentation in terms of frequency of use or perhaps um, severity, dependency, different kinds of substance use related um, harms that could possibly happen. People don't really talk about it as much. You know, everybody underreports how much they drink or if they're a smoker, things like that don't typically get mentioned, hide it even from their own physicians. So I feel that, you know, using health report, like utilization, healthcare utilization kind of data, we're able to get a better picture of the severity that occurs whenever they show up at the ER because it's severe enough for them to show up at the ER for certain kind of substances or if they overdose. Um, and you know, there's a, a certain part of a project that we would like to keep um, looking into moving forward is looking at if there is increased risk during certain kinds of um, events like holidays, Christmas, um, family gathering periods, or if um, Pride months like celebrations and events would, would have a higher occurrence of some acute care uh, rates. And you know, we're really interested in looking to these kinds of risks moving forward. If I might, just if I have time, Grant. <laughs> I, I realize I tend to have long-winded questions that are difficult to get at my point. My apologies. Um, so, so we can see that there's that kind of, there's a distance between people's self-reports and, you know, the acute care and, and the treatments that they're receiving, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's differences in that distance between LGB groups and, and other individuals or not? 
Mm. I'm not really, sh I'm not sure if there would be a difference between sexual minorities compared to heterosexuals or the general population about the difference in like whether they tend to underreport what they use. But I feel that at the same time, um, there's more unaddressed kind of um, minority stress problems that would occur for sexual minority groups that might affect them more in, in terms of what they're willing to disclose or um, what might be affecting the, the kind of disparity in terms of substance use that would affect them a lot more than they would the general population. And this is where we might not be able to get a more accurate measure for LGBT individuals where they're more at risk. Okay, thank you. That speaks more to that more direct um, value that having these linkages with the administrative data uh, can offer. Thank you. Okay, so a question from the audience. Um, how do we ensure that harm reduction outreach uh, teams are culturally sensitive and knowledgeable on LGB health? Um, I think um, Rainbow Health Ontario usually provides a lot of consultations and regular training to clinicians and organizations um, throughout Ontario. Um, so I, I think that would be kind of like a great I suppose, like first step to uh, just provide as much uh, training as possible. Like as one of the judges brought previously, it's not just the physicians who need training, but also there are lots of other people involved as well, uh, such as, um, you know, let's say police. Uh, so I think it would help a lot if there's a lot of education um, in terms of providing culturally sensitive care. Yeah, with the uh, harm reduction groups and all like organizations that or community led groups that would like to lead this um, particular outreach, I think that the collaborative effort with Rainbow Health Ontario, who's already been training professionals in this sense, would be a great way of moving forward to be able to cater towards the LGBT population in terms of how they could reduce um, substance use or, or, or educate them in, in um, minimizing the uh, substance use related harms. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Celine and Sukdeep for your presentation.